back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Uh, this is Finding Global Justice. We are on a search for global justice. And today we're talking to Mutasim Mutasim Ali, Mutasim. who's Correct. from Sudan and who joins us from Baltimore, Maryland today by Zoom. Thank you for joining us on the show, Mutasim. Thank you, Jay, for the opportunity. I'm grateful uh, to have this conversation. Well, I think it's important that we do. Um, so that my, my background uh, on it is that um, when we talk about tra transitional, we're talking about changes that take place in a given country or area and how it sort of shakes things up. And maybe you don't have the rule of law the way you'd like and and people take advantage of each other and and you get all kinds of um, you get all kinds of bad acts and um, and when we talk about uh, therefore when we talk about transitional justice we're talking about those acts and how to deal with them and we're talking about uh, Sudan Lord knows Sudan has had plenty of trouble and I wanted to uh, ask uh, my friend Alexa over here if she would help us with the definition of uh, transitional justice. I'm gonna do that now, if you don't mind, Mutasim. Yeah, um, go ahead. Alexa, what is transitional justice? According to Wikipedia, transitional justice consists of judicial and non-judicial measures implemented in order to redress legacies of human rights abuses. Such measures include criminal prosecutions, truth commissions, reparations programs, and various kinds of institutional reforms. Okay, that's helpful to start. Um, and maybe you could tell us also, you're, you're a lawyer, as I understand, Mutasim, and right. you're with the Project Expedite Justice, uh, which, right. is, which is actually out of Hawaii. Um, right. So could you talk about Project Expedite Justice and what you do as a lawyer in connection with transitional justice in Sudan? Um, thank you once again, Jay, for the opportunity to discuss this timely topic. I think it is extremely important. This is not just uh, for Sudan, but also worldwide and probably, you know, very relevant to, to America today. You know, uh, I joined the proje uh, project Expedite Justice um, August 2020. And one of the reasons why I joined this incredible organization, I'm grateful for the opportunity to work with uh, incredible lawyers who are um, very much dedicated to protecting and preserving human rights and making actually our world a better place. Part of the reason why I joined Project Expedite Justice is because of the commitment um, to human family. Um, what we do basically is to um, to you know to pr uh, follow human rights violations and to. Uh, do our best to remedy uh, the affected communities as a result of authoritarianism, um, prosecutions, war crimes, and uh, crimes against humanity and genocide. There are a lot of things, you know, um, that we do, uh, not just litigation, but also raising awareness, um, training attorneys in, you know, in many places, um, as you know, um, Project Expedite Justice is based in Hawaii, but we do work in uh, many places in Africa, in Ethiopia, in South Sudan, in Sudan, um, in Europe, in Cambodia, and there are many places we do a lot of work. And of course, you know, this continues as um, we continue to experience and witness human rights violations across the world. Uh, for me, particularly, it's very important, right? As a person from Sudan, you know, I, you know, I, I speak here as a lawyer, but also, you know, I am a survivor of uh, atrocities in Darfur. I don't know if you heard about Darfur. Darfur is in the western part of Sudan, and for the for your audience, Sudan is is northeastern Africa, and uh, Darfur is uh, Darfur is located in the western part of Sudan, where genocide were, was committed, uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. And for me, it's incredibly uh, special to join such organization. Maybe, maybe you can help us uh, understand exactly what was going on, <clears throat> and for that matter, what is going on in Sudan over these war crimes. Uh, you know, I get the notion that um, when you're talking about 
uh, transitional justice is because people were dislocated um, because for one reason or another, they had to move from their existing environment to another or they were disrupted in some way. Um, and then and then you have people taking advantage of them. But what you know, what was the, at least on the superficial level of it, why were there war, war crimes conducted? What was the hostility uh, in Darfur that, that, that made for such bad conduct? So Darfur is one part of the larger Sudan that is experiencing atrocities. There were other parts. For decades, Sudan has grappled with authoritarianism and the military coups um, that you know, uh, produced marginalization and prosecution. Um, South Sudan is one of the regions, now it's like a new independent state, that where approximately 2 million people were murdered as a result of a civil war between Sudan and, and the South, uh, South Sudan. There are a lot of arguments about the root causes of the civil war, uh, but not only the government of Sudan targeted its civilians, right? This is not a militia group that targeted other people. It is atrocities is sponsored by the government, right? And um, Darfur in 2003, when the government recruited militia groups named John Jawid. These are tribal militias. They were recruited to, um, to support the government to fight rebel groups that uh, picked, up, uh, picked up machine guns to fight against marginalization and towards uh, you know, democratic Sudan. Those militias together with the government committed um, you know, various human rights violations, to say the least. Uh, genocide, that's why the former president of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir, was indicted by International Criminal Court for, you know, genocide um, in Darfur, war crimes and crimes against humanity. Over um, approximately 300,000 people were murdered in Darfur. Over two and a half million people were displaced from their original homes. And now they live in IDP camps and internally displaced persons camps. And there are others who are uh, refugees in the neighboring countries like uh, Chad, Central African Republic. And there are many who somehow successfully made it to Western countries. And so the, this is just a glimpse of um, you know, the, what is happening actually in my home country, in Darfur and in Sudan. And that's why we are having this conversation today about transitional justice. We have, the, like we speak about transitional justice, um, usually in post-conflict societies, right? Because we would like to move from repression or authoritarianism to democratic uh, societies. And so how do we do that? This is why we speak about uh, transitional justice. There are, um, you know, uh, m three main aims, you know, uh, that I can just list briefly. One is uh, to, uh, it's a, rec a recognition for the uh, recognition of victims, right? Like the, the, we, we do transitional justice to recognize, right? To say, or to sympathize with with the victims of atrocities. This is number one thing. Number two is to also uh, memorialize, right? Like memorialize the, the atrocities, like uh, install museums or um, to make sure that these events are very well documented. And so, um, and, and, oh, and, and the most important thing is reconciliation, right? Like a societal healing um, that uh, we are, yes, post-conflict era, and that now we can live together and, uh, uh, you know, uh, begin a uh, democratic transition. Well, I get two things out of that. One is um, transitional for this purpose is the transition toward in the direction of democratic government, 
from an uh, autocracy, a dictatorship to a democratic government. That's the transition we are talking about in Sudan. How, right. how far along is Sudan? Is Sudan closer to a democratic government now than it was when this started, what, 20 years ago? Uh, I'd like to say um, the answer is yes, uh, because um, in 2018 and after, um, you know, several protests, like white public outrage against, uh, you know, uh, the former regime of President Bashir, um, the military, uh, transitional military council in Sudan removed Bashir from office, right? A person who has been in office for nearly 30 years. He committed um, atrocities, as I said, in Darfur, in South Sudan, and there are other areas, right? Noba Mountains and Blue Nile. And so the people of Sudan successfully removed him from office. Now, that's just one step towards that transition because Sudan is still deals with the remnants of the Bashir regime. And it is not easily, you, you know, it cannot be easily removed from the uh, system. And so it's, it's going to take a, a little while. And part of that, uh, part of the uh, process in the country right now is the transitional justice, right? And to, and to begin the transitional justice, there are a few things that um, you know, Sudan and many countries who aspire to begin the transitional process need to do. One is to set truth commissions, right? The idea of these truth commissions is to, um, you know, to, uh, they're basically non-judicial um, investigative bodies. They are temporary commissions. And the goal of these commissions um, is to um, make reports about uh, violence, abuse that occurred, the causes of those, uh, you know, atrocities and abuse, um, and the consequences, right? This is very important. Again, um, is to set the truth, uh, to acknowledge um, the atrocities and to recognize the victims, right? Um, and then um, we have uh, criminal prosecutions. This is part of accountability, right? Because the reason why we do uh, criminal prosecutions is not only for punishment, but also to say that, um, you know, to end impunity. Because if we do not end impunity, it raises another issue of revenge, right? Like anybody can say, hey, okay, um, my family was killed and uh, the person killed my family is still alive and no accountability, then I can easily revenge. And so we will never end that circle of violence, right, and abuses. And so that's why accountability is important. Then we have uh, reparations or redress uh, for the victims, right? Because again, um, the crimes and human rights violations are so grave. And for that, it is necessary to remedy the victims, right? That's like another whole subject, but uh, again, remedy is one key element. And then the most important thing is institutional reforms. And that would be also, that would be relevant here in America as well. Um, because- Yes, a lot of this is often, relevant in America right now. Right. And, and so because most of the atrocities let's say in the case of Sudan, were committed by the state, right? Not only by um, militia or paramilitary groups, by the state, which means that there is um, an institutional problem and that institutional problem needs to be addressed, right? And it is part of this transitional justice to address that institutional, uh, institutional problems. Just one thing to say, um, to conclude this point, is that transitional justice is not meant to address all the issues in the society, not at all. It is just 
one step uh, to deal with the past so that we can move forward towards a prosperous future. You mentioned reconciliation. And um, we, I think I, I would like to know where that fits in this continuum of, um, uh, of, of the corrective steps that, that a given country needs to take, that Sudan needs to take to, um, to, to have a, a, a decent quality of personal and political life and safety right. and security. Um, but the reconciliation, does that come at the end? after you've done all these other things, including reform, to come throughout. You know, that, as I mentioned, that you know, a lot of these issues are present right now at the end of the Trump administration. A lot of people say, well, we want um, you know, retribution, uh, we want punishment. Accountability means punishment. Um, right. And other people say, no, 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 let's reconcile, let's turn the other cheek, let's move on and, and um, not engage in retribution and punishment. Um, right. where, where, how does that compare with the, the continuum that you're describing in Sudan with respect to um, transitional justice? So all of these elements can go hand in hand, but I think number one thing is you need to set a, com, um, you know, a fact-finding mission, right? Like a truth commission. That's uh, first and foremost. Um, but in terms of where reconciliation fits, reconciliation as a term is more of is like a victims-centered approach, right? Because if victims said, "Hey, we would like to have punishment instead of amnesty," then that's what happens, right? Because the most important thing is to uh, satisfy victims. The transitional justice is a is like a victim-centered um, mechanism, and so um, if that reconciliation means punishment, then it will be punishment. If it means amnesty, then it will be amnesty. But at the end of the day, when we look at a number of examples, right? Um, for instance, uh, uh, you know, in Rwanda, it really doesn't have to be either punishment or amnesty, it could be something in between. And so um, to, and the example of Rwanda is really, uh, you know, it is incredible because, you know, after horrific, uh, you know, atrocities that were committed in Rwanda, Rwanda is now moving forwards, right? They actually establish, uh, you know, community um, tribunals, um, as they call it, Gochacha uh, tribunals. These are meant to a satisfy victims to see that how trials are conducted, um, and uh, and that's how the healing um, began. And so um, reconciliation and punishment and all of those uh, uh, things are mainly victims centered. Very interesting. When you get to the end of the continuum, um, I guess there comes a time when somebody says, "Okay." Uh, we have achieved what we wanted here. Uh, we have, um, you know, had reform, reconciliation, and where appropriate punishment and all that. Um, is it is it is it a certainty that this all won't happen again? Because you do need a, a government and a people who are part of the government and who are heard by the government. You have to have a rule of law where dictators are not permitted to take power and so forth. Um, can we be sure that when you get to the end of the transition, so to speak, that it all won't happen again? No, we cannot be sure, unfortunately. But, um, but, that, that, but that's part of the reason why we have um, um, institutional reforms, right? Uh, because um, generally speaking, democracies and governments are, you know, um, sort of uh, fragile institutions. And those institutions need to be uh, sort of uh, strengthened regularly, need to be protected regularly. And part of that protection is to, uh, you know, to do law reforms, right? And, um, and, for, uh, and law reforms is not something, you know, it's not a static thing, right? Like, 
um, you know, human rights are um, evolving, right? Like nobody thought um, 100 years ago that there's like a right to development, for instance, right? Now it became a right. And so we have to keep adopting ourselves as we go along. And that's why the, um, the, the, um, the institutional reforms is an essential element in the transitional justice. Um, again, we will never make sure that, uh, you know, that those atrocities or crimes will not be committed again. But once again, if we have a strong uh, institutions, strong, um, uh, you know, laws that uh, do not uh, prosecute or discriminate uh, against people, then we have uh, bigger chances to live in peace. You know, one of the things you said, uh, you talked about the truth commissions. I find that very interesting because we, you know, we've had trouble with truth in our government over the past administration and everybody is very concerned about that. And, um, and then, you know, you read all the commentary and it suggests that if you don't have truth in government, if you don't have public truth, um, you wind up in a dictatorship. Um, it's, it's, it's a slippery slope when you start telling lies to people, and uh, when you, especially when you tell a lot of lies or big lies. And uh, that, that it really touches me to, to, to hear about truth commissions. But, but, but query, you know, how do you prevent falsehoods from entering into the conversation later? Um, do you need to reform on that as well? where there's a rule somewhere that says, no, you may not tell lies if you are in power or aspiring to power. Now that's the most di difficult part um, because on one hand, we do not uh, want to have, um, you know, people in charge of our government to lie because in the end, the consequence will be, you know, the events as we saw in Washington DC um, last week, right? And that's, um, that's terrible. Uh, but on the other hand, it raises another issue of freedom of speech, right? Like how do we balance, you know, uh, between these two compelling um, arguments? Um, that's really a difficult thing to do. But at the end of the day, um, in the context of transitional justice, um, you know, when we when we say truth commission, we primarily mean to document the event, like to discover what happened, right? Like for people to know, right? Like uh, if um, how many people were killed, right? Why were they killed? What were the root causes, and how can we prevent? Those are the reasons why we. But in terms of uh, but what we see in America today, that's, that's really a very difficult um, conversation uh, because, again, you have, uh, you, know, f you know, freedom of speech on one hand. This is one of the uh, bedrock of um, this country, right? That's what make, makes America um, unique on one hand. But on the other, you know, we don't want to continue to see the events as we saw in Washington DC. And by the way, the events we saw in Washington DC, uh, those were not the first time to see such events, right? Like um, America has a very long history of such events, as, you know, going back to slavery to lynching period in 1982 to 1968 and all of those. Those were horrific events, right? Uh, and we continue to see that. And so, um, it is. It is really it, that. That's a really difficult conversation and uh, for Americans to have. But again, I think the most important part here is that uh, we have to have, you know, uh, serious conversation. Uh, in, speaking of in America, right? Uh, some sometimes such conversation might be uncomfortable, but we've got to speak about that so that we can move to a more. Um, uh, to a safer uh, society. Yeah. Well, every every country that uh, wants to have democracy, that pretends to have democracy, um, has to be has to be engaged in a public conversation, a true public conversation, um, where people are informed and educated. 
And I think that's uh, one of the problems uh, in the US, but it's probably a problem in many countries around the world. You describe a sequence of events, a sequence of steps um, that are in aid of, 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 of going to democracy, of enhancing democracy, of, of building democracy in Sudan. But don't you need for that a certain public, public information system, an educational system where people know what the right is and they know what their rights are and they know what a war crime is and uh, what, you know, what is a violation of their rights um, and how the government should work. It, it seems to me that one critical piece in Sudan, in the United States and everywhere, if you wanna have a democracy, people have to be educated about what it means, the, the relationship of, of the public and the government, it has to right. be understood. So right. what, what is happening in Sudan about that? Right. So because Sudan is not yet in the process of, you know, uh, well, I would say in the, be in the beginning of transitional justice, right? But we're far away uh, from providing such information, like for people to be aware of their rights, of uh, human rights violations and all of those stuff, right? Um, but in the end, the, uh, you know, you, you eloquently elaborated on that, like, giving information to public is an important thing to do. And, and that has to be, um, you know, because in the end, even if we make uh, law reforms, institutional reforms, if not translated into information for public to know, then we still did not do much. And so for that reason, distributing accurate information and for public to have access to information is the key towards um, better society. So here you are, you're a lawyer, you're from Sudan, you're with Project Expedite uh, Justice. Um, you, you understand and advance the notion of uh, democracy and, and human rights, and um, you, um, you want to stop uh, violations of human rights and atrocities and war, war crimes. What are you doing in that regard? What steps are you taking and why? And, and maybe you could tell us a little about how you were a victim back in Sudan. Right. So one of the things I am doing is by working uh, for and with incredible people at the Project Expedite Justice, right? This is one of the things that we, we make. Um, that's how I think I can make a change. Um, you know, I, I, I left Darfur when I was 16. My family is still in internally displaced persons camp. Now it's 18 years, right? I've seen um, the events in Darfur. And that's, that's how I'm driven, right? Um, the reason I'm, what I actually, I, you know, I studied geology before becoming a lawyer. And I had to shift the, you know, my specialty because of the pain that the people in Darfur and across Sudan are enduring. And I am really committed to do whatever I can to support people back. And I am incredibly, you know, grateful to find people who share with me this mission. And those people are uh, my colleagues at Project Expedite Justice. Of course, we have, uh, our hands are not very long, right? We cannot reach everywhere, but we are determined and committed to making our world a better place. So can you talk about the interest of the world in Sudan these days and in the mission of uh, Project Expedite Justice? I mean, for example, um, are you, are, do you get help from other agencies around the world, other countries? Do you get help from NGOs? Do you get help from the, uh, the International Court of Criminal Justice um, do, do other countries step in and try to help you achieve these goals? Or is it all internal in Sudan, you know, with, with help from uh, organizations limited to organizations like Project Expedited Justice? Uh, thankfully, all, um, you know, in the last uh, two years uh, after the um, overthrow of the former President Omar al-Bashir, 
um, you know, a lot of people in the international community um, sort of really extended their hands and to support the Sudanese people to move towards, um, you know, uh, peace and, uh, and stability. And um, there are many international organizations, there are many grassroots organizations that are involved in this. But because the needs, uh, the needs are so uh, high, right? Like there are so much that the country needs. The country was uh, almost, um, you know, uh, countries vanished, right? And so there is much need to be um, done. Um, you know, the International Criminal Court is now, you know, prosecuting um, a case of um, mass atrocities and uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity uh, in Darfur. Uh, there are a lot of challenges, um, but but that's a, a good thing for the victims to know, hey, there is a pro there's prosecution going on and that's a good step. It, it really instills hope in the hearts of the victims, but not only victims in Darfur, but across the world, right? Like the, the crimes against humanity, you know, cannot go without you know, uh, without accountability. Perpetrators must be held accountable. That's a good thing. At Project Expedite Justice, we do uh, our part in terms of training local lawyers to document, uh, to investigate and prosecute human rights violations, uh, to train lawyers to um, how to navigate through different mechanisms, right? Like we know that there are domestic mechanisms if uh, possible. If not, then we have regional mechanisms or international mechanisms such as International Criminal Court. Um, and so this is one of the things that we do. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, we communicate uh, on a daily basis with our, you know, with our partners in Sudan to just think of what would be the best way to help them, uh, you know, uh, participate in the transition. Must be interesting in a in a case pending in Darfur, or anywhere in Sudan, um, to, to 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 make a case for uh, war crimes and violation of human rights and all. Um, who is going to oppose that case? Who would step forward and 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 take the other side of it? Oppose your attempts, the Project Expedite Justice attempts to prosecute, um, and how hard is it to deal with those people who would oppose you? And how dangerous is it to deal with those people who would oppose you? And, and at the moment, you know, we're not litigating case in Sudan, except one case that is, and hopefully we'll come up uh, to litigate more cases, uh, but we have only uh, one case at the moment, which is the French bank, BMP, uh, Bariba, uh, Baribas Bank. That's one case, which is a, a huge case. And I hope that um, um, many more cases will come. But um, to your question, of course, there are a lot of people, who, you know, who justice is not in the best uh, of their interest. Among them, the perpetrators. These are people who will definitely oppose prosecutions and accountability. Um, the remnants of the former regime, they will oppose uh, the um, prosecution, and particularly when we speak of international prosecutions. Um, I'd also like to say that there, maybe there, there are uh, some people in the current government, because we have a very complex uh, government. It's like a joint government between civilian leaders and uh, military generals. And those military generals were part, some of them were, uh, um, uh, all of them were part of the Bashir regime. And so, you know, prosecution um, for the crimes committed in Darfur might not be in their interest. And so we, uh, I personally expect some opposition there. Uh, but in the end, um, this the crimes committed in Darfur will be prosecuted and perpetrators will be held accountable and victims will be remedied, redressed for the grievances that they endured. Good. And there are a lot of people in this country 
and other countries who want to see that happen because they believe that war crimes are crimes not only against the individual victims or in individual countries, but they're crimes against humanity everywhere. And right. they, they cannot be permitted to exist they, and be committed um, you know, by any moral uh, authority in the world among humanity. And so uh, I do want to ask you about about the United States. <clears throat> the United States has been isolationist over the past four years. Um, query whether the United States has been helpful in dealing with these moral issues, um, in trying to suppress crimes against humanity. Um, and uh, I'd also like to know uh, what you would hope from the Biden administration going forward uh, in that same regard. Uh, what do you think, Butasi? Um, number one thing I think um, is the United States and the Biden, uh, the Biden administration um, must reverse the damage caused by the Trump administration. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but the, the Trump administration actually imposed sanctions on um, the ICC personnel, the ICC prosecutor, and that's real trouble, in addition to many other human rights bodies. Um, and and so, number one thing is for the Biden administration to, um, you know, to um, to correct the damage um, that you know um, made by the Trump administration. Uh, and number two um, is to I really hope I don't know if this is uh, you know is uh, likely to happen, but uh, to join the ICC, uh, uh, Rome Statute. Right, Rome started is like the governing status of uh, international criminal court, and I hope that the United States will join that, especially after witnessing, uh, you know, um, the, the atrocities in uh, in the last uh, and the crimes that committed not only in America but uh, across the world um, in the last four years, and I think um, um, this is one of the things that will be key. Uh, in the Biden administration. Of course, now we're dealing with new circumstances, COVID-19, and that sort of created another issue, right? Like um, uh, there were many other human rights violations as a result of COVID-19, and that's sort of, uh, it, it requires a special um, consideration. But at the end of the day, I think, um, um, you know, um, Biden administration need to be committed not to human rights issues, but not only not only committed, but also to support the organizations that do incredible work uh, to protect and preserve human rights. Yeah, it's an obligation on all of us. Some of us do more, you do more, and uh, we should appreciate you and think about you every day doing what you do. Uh, and I know I'll be watching uh, the inauguration on Wednesday, and I know you will too. And while I watch, Mutasim, I'll be thinking of you. Thank I really you, Dave. Appreciate, appreciate your coming down today. Thank you. I hope we get to talk again soon. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Aloha. Take care.